for graph problems. Yes. Um, so this is something that maybe a number of people would be interested in. It involves you know, sparse re representations of graphs. Um, so he'll be around for the rest of the day, and we're just looking for people to talk to. Thanks. So especially given the small size, feel free to interrupt at any point, uh, hopefully not by yelling you lie, but you know, with <laughs> slightly more constructive questions. But I'll take you lie as well, and then we can. <laughs> I won't be as polite as the president. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit more on the learning theory side of things. So this is joint work with Satyan Kale and Ravi Kumar, both of them at Yahoo, both of them at Yahoo out on the West Coast. Um, I'm out here up in New York. So let's go through kind of the title, and we'll I'll motivate it slowly to explain what all these things are. So machine learning, we usually deal with data. So we have a lot of data. Here's a sample, non-uniform sample from my mailbox. The data usually comes with labels. So I didn't win the MS World Lottery, unfortunately, nor the Nigerian spam. Uh, but the holiday party was an actual email. There's a workshop. And you know, what we do in machine learning is we try to predict. So we try to learn some hypothesis that performs well on unseen data. So if I get an email later that says answers to many questions, it feels like spam. It looks like spam from the title. That was actually legitimate. Uh, whereas the newsletter, which feels legitimate, is actually not. But that's why we look more and that just the title. So one of the questions is, of course, how do you evaluate the learning algorithm that you have? And the usual scenario is you have some holdout test set. So here's another test set. Here's a different sample from the mailbox where we can ask the hypothesis to go ahead and label whether these are spam or whether these are not spam. Um, and then we check with the labels that we had. And lo and behold, here our error is 0. We're doing perfectly. So of course, the next we have to write this up. We have to submit this to a conference. We're feeling very proud of ourselves. Um, we wait about three months, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. And the reviewers come back and they say, I completely don't believe you. They really do go with this whole like you lie routine. Uh, right? And they say, <clears throat> well, what if you had a different test set? What if you had a different training set? What if you had my email? How would I know that this would actually work? Kind of prove to me. So a little bit more formally, what they're saying is that there's some distribution of the expected performance of your algorithm. Right? There's, sometimes it performs worse, sometimes it performs better. What you gave me is a single data point sampled from this distribution. Maybe you were nice, and it's a uniformly at random sample point. Probably isn't, because there's a selection bias. If your results were awful, you wouldn't have sent them in. But let's ignore that issue at all. Um, <clears throat> completely. So you gave me a single data point from this distribution. It's an unbiased estimator of the mean. Fine. Uh, but of course, it has absurdly high variance. So maybe you gave me this little point all the way to the left. But if the expected performance is way further out. So let's reduce the variance. We know how to do this. Let's take k different samples. We take a new training set. We take a new test set. We run the same experiment, we do the same thing. We know that repeating k times will reduce the variance by factor 1 over k. So it should get the reviewers to believe us a lot more if now I don't give you a simple single data set, but I give you a bunch of different data sets. And of course, this is what you see happening. But this is a bit wasteful. Right? And so labeled data for us is usually quite expensive to come by. So it's not every day that you can get a large data set that's labeled correctly or mostly correctly, this is spam, this is not spam. Um, <clears throat> and in this scenario, we used every data point exactly once. We either used it for training or we used it for evaluation. Now, this is great because this gives us a nice unbiased estimator. But can we reuse some of the data? Can we do something slightly better? And in practice, the answer is yes. And this is what people do left and right. You take your data set. And you split it into k chunks. They're called folds. And you repeatedly train on all but one of them, and you evaluate your answer on the others. So if you do four-fold cross-validation, you'll train on the first three, get a test result, and do this over and over. You'll have some error rate that you're getting on each one. And maybe the top one, it really is 0. But on the others, it's significantly non-zero. 
you go ahead, you average these, and you report this as your error rate. <clears throat> this is cross-validation. It's easy to see then, again, if you don't kind of cheat and you ignore selection bias for a little bit, this is unbiased. <clears throat> Each one of these is unbiased, and then you're just averaging them. And this is typically done for very small k. So cross-validation is usually threefold, fivefold, maybe tenfold. But of course, if you run this, the more times you run this, the more expensive it is. So if, in, in, even if your algorithm is linear, if you do leave one out, so you do all but a single example, you have an n-squared time solution. And that's just too expensive. Of course, the problem is, is that these are no longer independent. So I can't come to you and say, OK, look, I did this k times. My variance reduced by 1 over k. You should believe me. This is why you don't believe me. Um, and the question that we're going to address is really how not independent are they? How much does the variance reduce in this particular situation? So again, this is cross-validation. Everybody does it left and right. You cannot, I would wager a bet that you cannot really submit um, a paper into a machine learning conference without running cross-validation if you're running some experiments on it, unless you have some obscene amount of data that you can just replicate on enough data sets. Uh, you do it often for parameter tuning. So you have some algorithm. It's going to take some parameter. Maybe it's you're doing some late annealing and it's your cooling schedule. Maybe you're doing something else. And you just have to decide, OK, which parameter is best? What is the best setting? How do I do this? Well, I'll run it under cross-validation, under different settings. I'll see which one performs the best. That's the one I'm going to use. You do this for evaluation, of course, as we just went through. Nobody really knows why they're doing it. Um, it seems like a good idea. It doesn't seem like a bad idea. It seems plausible that this is a better estimate. Um, but from a theoretical analysis standpoint, we only have these so-called insanity check bounds by Blum, Kalai, and Langford, they say, well, the variance of this estimator is no larger, really strictly smaller, than of a single test train estimate. It really is that insanity does not happen. This would be quite odd if you were to average a whole bunch of estimates, and now your variance went up. It would be strange. Thankfully, it doesn't happen. It required some work to actually prove this. We'll prove this along the way today. Um, and the, the real question, and this is the central question here, is how much is the variance really reduced? Right? So we know it's no larger. That doesn't really make me feel much better. Um, <clears throat> we don't know if it's a tiny little bit not larger or if it's a lot not larger. Do I need to do all this other work, or does it not buy me anything overall? OK, so any questions before I jump into kind of a more formal and really start writing down some math on here? OK, so just a little bit of notation. It's all pretty self-contained, and it's going to be obvious. So we have the examples usually come from some distribution, distribution D over the features. So this is like the email title, the body, who they come from, et cetera, and the labels. So why is the set of labels? This is, is this spam, or is this not spam? Uh, we have a data set which is sampled from this distribution. And a learning algorithm, all it does is it produces a hypothesis, which is a function from the features into the labels. Given an email, tell me, is this spam or is this a normal email? And to measure the performance, there is some loss function, which says, here is the right label. Here is what your algorithm produced. Give me some number between 0 and m, where we'll assume m is a constant, sufficiently large if you need to, to say how well did the algorithm perform on this example. It could be binary classification, and then these are plus minus one. It could be regression, then you're trying to get close to a line, then these are real values. And that's it. So the, I mean, the symmetry, is this a, I mean, it seems, you can always ensure that you have symmetry. Right, so you can randomly, randomly, yeah, per, not perturb, whatever, the no. data, permute, thank you, the data, and then you'll ensure that it's symmetry. We'll need the symmetry, as it turns out. OK, so now what are we measuring? Well, given a particular training set, the expected performance is just expectation over all test examples of the loss learned of the algorithm learned on this training set over the examples. 
And now we're going to go over the random training set U. So this is the expected performance. This is, again, easy to estimate. If you do, don't cheat, you just draw a random test example, random training example. This is the expectation that you're going to get. Um, <clears throat> what are we going to look at? We're going to look at this quantity called the generalization error, which really says, OK, you did this and you produced some estimate. That's fine. Now, I'm going to do this and run your algorithm on some unknown data set that you haven't seen before that's drawn from the same distribution. How much of a gap do I expect to see? So you told me your estimator gets a 5% error rate. I should be seeing about 5% on held out samples. But there will be some wiggle room. There will be some difference. And this is the generalization error. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to look at is, of course, the generalization error, if you didn't cheat, the expectation of this thing is set to 0 because you have an unbiased sample. So to look at the quality of it, oh, before we do that, so the cross-validation, all it says is I'll take the same set u, I'll divide it into k chunks, each of size n, and then the ith classifier is just trained on everything but one of the chunks and evaluated on the last one, just as we had in pictures. And the generalization here is just the average of the generalization errors. Now here we can finally get into kind of the real question is, as I said, this is an unbiased estimate. So the expectation of the generalization errors is 0. So we're going to look at the variance of this quantity. Can you look at the generalization error? Sure. So the generalization error is the difference between the performance, the expected performance that I have and the actual performance that I measure on some particular test set. And the difference between the two is the generalization error. And now I'll look at the expectation over all of the training sets for this algorithm. So we're looking now at the variance of this quantity, so the variance over the data that I have of the generalization error that I will produce. So it takes a couple of minutes to untangle these things. So the, the expectation of these is 0 everywhere. And again, because we're looking at the difference between what I expect to get and what I've measured, and what I've measured is an unbiased predictor of what I expect to get. So the, the expectation is 0 throughout, but the variances are not. And we have two bounds. What we're going to look for is, OK, how do these two differ? And now restating the insanity check bounds and our question formally is, well, we know that the variance <coughs> of the cross-validation classifier is strictly less than the variance of just a single classifier that we have. This was the insanity check. Because this is intuitively, if I wave my hands, this is an average of k things. This is one of these things. The average variance should be sm smaller. It takes a little bit of work to, do, to get this strict inequality, but at least less than or equal to should be pretty, <coughs> pretty clear. And we know that the best possible is a factor of k. If I get my <coughs> variance reduced by more than a factor of k, I'm doing some black magic. So um, if, I mean, you would think that you would need uh, to make it worthwhile, you would want to have it draw to it most like k minus 1 over k to make, or something like that, because you could just do, I mean, if, if it were sort of linear in the amount of data or something like mm -hmm. that, you, you're, you're getting, or, or, or something like that, it seems. Right, so you want to get some improvement. The more you do, the lower you, you want to get. I mean, so 1 over k would be great, one right? 1 over k would be great, but, but if it didn't reduce at all, you're doing k over k minus 1. So something like, uh, and, and anyway, uh, maybe I've got it wrong. So you're doing k times as much work, right, right. in so order in to produce this. To get to get the variance down, yeah. to right? That point. Yeah, I would have to write it down. Yeah, I think so this is a yeah. So we, you know, there's these hidden parameters, which is how big is the training set and how big is the mm -hmm. data set. I assume that you're trying, you're comparing these with the, those two parameters fit. Yes. And the training set 
the test set always equal to one in K? Of the training set, the absolutely. Training set. Mm -hmm. That's right. OK, so this is, this is the question. We're going to be somewhere between these two. The, as it turns out, we'll be closer to here than to here, provided some other conditions hold. OK, so how do we go? Now, the, the cross-validation estimate is a very dependent beast. right? It would be great if these were k-independent things, but now I have whole sort of dependencies going on because I usually share a k minus 2 over k, a very large fraction of my data set, usually more than half. Well, you know, you look at, you, you get a little depressed because you stare at this and you say, how am I ever going to unravel this? Then you get some coffee, you feel a little bit better, and then you just start writing down everything you know. So you say, well, the generalization there is a sum, is the average of the individuals. So I can look at the variance. Well, it's just going to be sum of a whole bunch of covariances. Aha, uh -huh, there is a little bit of symmetry. There's not much going on because so I can look at these covariances. I can look where the i and j are the same. Well, this will be just the variance on that particular fold. All folds are the same because of symmetry. So now I can say, OK, there's a 1 over k term, which is just the variance on a single one, plus a bunch of these covariances that are left over. And you feel a little bit better because you say, OK, well, this is the optimal term, and this is the error that I have. So I can go about and do a little bit. So the, the, the symmetry is also the training set and the... And the, the different folds, yeah. So if you infer symmetry, but you're muting everything randomly, mm -hmm. then all the k-tests will be on the exact same there. So we have permutation of the same there. So I permute first, permute. and then I do the k-folds. Yeah. So now they'll be on different data sets. I don't permute each time, right? So in particular, so what I need to look at is now the covariance between the following two events. So here I have four folds. And I switch the train and test in two different ones. And now each one of these has some generalization error, whatever it may be. I'm going to call it gen 1 and gen 2. And I want to look at the covariance over the full set, u being s, t, and t prime, of this whole thing of the generalization here versus generalization here. And again, I'm going to say, you know, this looks messy. I'm going to write down what I know. And I'm going to use sort of this law of total covariance. I'm just going to condition first on S and T, which were the first two. And this is what I get. Um, now, if you stare at this a little bit, there's this term of the expectation over t prime of the generalization error of the first fold. So what does this mean? So let's look at the first fold. And we're looking at t prime. t prime is the test. So they, we know that the generalization error is an unbiased predictor. So this expectation is actually equal to 0. And since this expectation is equal to 0, this term completely falls out. Right? So now I've reduced the covariance to just looking at this beastly looking expression. And it's not clear if I made any progress. But I'm going to claim that we have. So here's the first set of inequalities. So from the previous slide, I get the, the top equation. This is just copying. And now I do two, two applications of Cauchy Schwartz. So first, I, re I replace the variance by just the square root of the the covariance by the square root of the product of the variances. And now, <clears throat> if I were to um, stop here, I can now say, well, <clears throat> well, let me not do that. Then I'll do the Cauchy-Schwartz again and just move the square root outside. Now, there's one more <clears throat> manipulation that we need, which is to say, well, what is the variance on the single fold? So if we look at the variance on the single fold, I'll do the same, now the law of total variance instead of total covariance. And here, too, I know that the second term is 0 by the same exact logic. So that goes away. So all I've done so far is to say, OK, the covariance 
is less than the square root of these two things. Now, this <clears throat> may be jumping into a little bit too deep, so let's jump back out and see what this means. So this is what we have proved so far. So again, we have, we're looking at the variance that we care about. We have the optimal term, which is the first term, and we have the error term. The error term has a nice thing that the first part of the error term is sort of in the same units as this thing. Right? At least we know, we don't know what it is, we don't know quite how to deal with it, but at least it's in the same units. So we'll forget about it for, for a second. And we'll focus on what the second term is. Again, it's some kind of expectation of a variance of a difference. So what does it really say? So it says the following. So we're in the second trial. And here, we're looking at the variance over t prime, which is part of the training set of the generalization error on the rest. So what does this mean? So I have a data set. I'm going to change a small chunk of it. I'm going to pretend that I randomly resample a small part of it. But my test set remains the same. How does my error change? Now you look back and you say, this feels like stability. So if I have, if my error doesn't change very much as I change a part of my training set, that means the algorithm is stable, that kind of everything it's learning is coming from the rest of it, which is staying the same. If my error changes a lot, then it's unstable. Question? No. And this is when you say, aha, maybe stability matters. And maybe this kind of makes you feel better, because in practice, most of the algorithms you use are stable, because if they aren't stable, then you don't know what to expect from them, and then you're too afraid to use them. So maybe stability really does play a role in the analysis as well. So again, what we want to, what remains to bound is to say, here I have this whole test training set. I have a test set. I'm going to change a part of my training set, a small part, but a constant fraction of it. How does my error change on the same test set? If my error doesn't change at all and this term is 0, I get optimum reduction. Presumably, if this error changes a tiny little bit, well, smaller than the first term, then I'll still get a reduction. And if my error is huge, then I don't know what to do. So you're not going to use the way in which you change the last term just to be changed adversarially? It's not changed adversarially. It's sampled uniformly. Again, remember that this. Your analysis doesn't use that. Yes. OK, so what is known about algorithm stability? So we're far from the first ones to look at it. It's kind of over 30 years old. Um, and there's a whole line of work and different notions of what algorithm stability means in terms of learning. And we'll go through all four of these. They all say approximately the same thing, just relaxing the notion as things go forward. So what is the kind of the most restrictive concept is this thing called uniform hypothesis stability. So let's do the setting. The setting is, again, we have a data set, S. We're going to change a single training element. So this is going to be S prime. And we're going to look at the evaluation on some element Z. So we take S, we change a single element. This is going to give us S prime. And we have some element Z that we evaluate on. And what does this say? This says, well, for any data set S, for any element z prime with which we change things. So for any s and s prime that we get, for any test element z, your, the change in your loss, the change in your error rate cannot be too much. So no matter what you do, if you only change a single training example out of all of the examples that you have, you can't really change your evaluation too much. This may seem very restrictive. It's somewhat, it is quite restrictive. But it works, and there are some algorithms that satisfy this notion. But only in the continuous yes. case. Yes. Yeah. Um, you can relax this in an obvious way, and this is what lets you go from uniform to weak, is you say, well, <clears throat> let's just do this with some probability 1 minus delta. Let's not do this over all training sets, examples, and new training sets. But let's do this for most of them. So it's kind of good on average, almost. And this is what gets you from uniform to weak hypothesis stability. But you're still looking at the maximum. 
you're looking at the maximum over training over test examples. Yeah. yeah. It's great, it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. And that's the algorithm is causal adjacent, so you're so you're looking at some expectation in there. Yeah. yeah. You can relax this now further, and this is now the expectation over all the test examples. So the expectation over examples is bounded by some beta. And then you can look at kind of the strongest notion. This is this error stability that says, if I change my one example, the expected error, so here the L bar is just the expectation of these errors. The expected error doesn't change. So this is kind of the gamut from the weakest to the strongest, or the strongest to the weakest, whichever way you look at it. So on one hand, we say, no matter what you do, you can't change this much, to saying, well, in ex with high probability or with some probability, in expectation, you don't change this much. So there's no bar there. Um, there's, oh wait, so this is a measurement of the difference between the probability distributions? Uh, yeah. Okay. Exactly. So we're going to add one more notion of stability into the mix um, because none of these were good enough for us. It's going to sit somewhere in between these two. Um, and here's kind of the notion in picture. So again, the same setting. We're going to change, and we're going to look at, look at as one example in the training set changes, what are we going to look at. And we're really looking at the expectation of the square of the differences of the losses. So is this the L2 version of the L1? It is the L2 version of the L1. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Or I can rephrase this more compactly, but maybe less kind of what's going on. It's the variance of the loss. It's the real variance, well, twice the real variance of the loss, as I change one of the examples. So as I change one of the training examples, what is the variance in the right-hand column in expectation? So expectation over the training set and over that example itself. So the previous slide, this is why we're calling this mean squared, the mean coming from the expectation and the square coming here. But it's really almost what you would expect to write down if I asked you what should, ver what should stability of an algorithm be. You will say, well, it should be the variance, because that's kind of what we measure. Uh, find the variance under a single example and expectation over everything else. So I can claim ex post that this is natural. Of course, the way these things come out is that this is what we need in the proof, and the explanation comes later. Can you go back to the previous definition? Sure. So, so you don't have a, this probability when n is zero? No, because we have an expectation over everything. And that's what makes it weaker than this. So all of these, the first three will imply some stability for this mean squared stability. If we have mean squared stability, we can imply some notion of error stability, but it's not clear how they play with each other. They're really kind of different notions. OK, so there's one more hammer that we need in order to complete this whole proof. And the final hammer, oh. So before I go into that, so again, this notion of stability, because it's weaker than a lot of the previous notions, we can just take all of their results for which algorithms are stable and claim that they're stable as well with the right parameter settings and the right kind of adjustment of parameters. But this is just careful algebra. So there is a laundry list. The main thing here is least squares regression, which is often used. Um, Usually it's known as k nearest neighbor. Here it's t since we already used k. Uh, ERM is empirical risk minimization, which is to say I have my training set. I have a set of hypotheses classes. I'm just going to find the best one on this training set. I won't care about overfitting. I won't care about anything else. Just minimize the risk on what I know. And this is ERM. So over finite VC dimensional, it's stable with some set of parameters. And we'll get to the set exactly. OK, so again, this is where we were. And we said 
<coughs> oh, we have this gnarly looking thing. We know what it means. And we said, <coughs> it looks and feels like stability. So let's define a notion of stability and let's go to it. So finally, we'll just use Steele's inequality. And what it allows us to do is to almost deconstruct things, is to say, OK, well, we have something that's a symmetric function on n variables. We're looking for its variance. Let's look at the variance as you, perturb, as you change a single example in it. And this is exactly what we're doing here. And some algebra, which I'll spare you, just says the following. We needed to bound this quantity. It's exactly the stability that we have to get. This is not a two-line proof. It's a little bit more algebra than that. If it were two lines, I would show it to you. Um, but it's nothing complex. It really is just sort of careful algebra. Not much more going on. And this leads us to the main theorem statement of the whole work. So we have the variance of the cross-validation. This is what we want to measure. We have the variance of the single classifier. This is what we have, 1 over k. So this is the optimum reduction. And then we have now an error term which we can make sense of. So the error term is 1 minus 1 over k. Fine. Beta is the stability of the algorithm that we have. Here we have the same variance as we have here. And then there's the over 2 because of the way the stability is defined. And again, you stare at this for a little bit and you say, OK, when is this good? When is this bad? Well, it's good when beta is much less than this variance term. And it's bad otherwise. <laughs> um, you can prove that beta is always less than this variance term. So the question is, how much less is really what it comes down to. <clears throat> so looking at it, we can look at the following setting to begin with. It's to say, well, Data in reality, in practice, is usually noisy. So what does noisy mean? Well, if you have classification, spam, not spam, let me flip the label with some small probability delta. So this is the user thinking that this is spam, but it's really not. They actually signed up for it. Or the, the other way around, you know, they really think that they won the Microsoft lottery, um, even though it's sad to say they haven't. Um, in uh, regression, you just add a little bit of noise a little bit of Gaussian noise, and this will get you some value of delta computed accordingly. So what happens then is that the variance of the single classifier is bounded from below by this delta over n. Delta is constant, so about 1 over n, where n is the number of examples in a single fold. And now <coughs> we can say, well, let's look at hypothesis-stable algorithms, which we know are least squares, regression, bounded SVMs, et cetera. And here we get a near optimal variance reduction. So we get a 1 plus little o of 1. And the little o of 1 goes down as 1 over square root of n. So it's not like this little o of 1 that's like 1 over log star that goes down but doesn't really go down. It really doesn't exist for all intents and purposes. So for these guys, we're getting the optimal reduction in variance, even though we're using super dependent estimates to do it. Uh, you have a, if I recall correctly, you have a bound on the variables, on the size of the variables that you can get. So you can't go out kind of arbitrarily. Um, the local rules are not quite as nice. So things work out, but we get a 1 over square root of k reduction, and there's this pesky order 1 term that's on top. So this, this works, but only when k is kind of sufficiently large. So we can't really prove this for five-fold cross-validation. We can prove that it kind of behaves <coughs> the right way, but it doesn't quite behave as, as well as we want it to. And then, of course, we can say, well, maybe you're not, maybe you're in a different setting, so you don't have this noise, or you're doing ERM. And here we use, again, the previous results on stability that say, well, ERM is stable if the VC dimension is small. And here, too, the second term starts going away exponentially small, and it starts disappearing. So in these situations, we also get about a 1 over k variance reduction, because we know that the, the first term is rather large, kind of 1 over n, 1 over n to the 3 halves-ish. Uh, but the other term goes away exponentially. 
and so it just disappears. M is the total amount of data, yeah, so n times k. So that's about it here. Question before I, or? Maybe you could get some of the arguments that you had, like um, ER is stable. So those I can't sketch. Uh, those require kind of a fair amount of work. Uh, and this is the work by Kruten and Yogi from about seven years ago now. Um, but that's like a 40-page manuscript that requires to do this. So if you go back, it seems like you um, are already getting uh, you know, a, a better worst-case result. Like it's not just that you're going to there is going to drop because the data is always smaller than the than at variance. It looks like you you always get a better right. So, so yeah, that formula. Uh, so beta over two is always less oh, than or equal. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I misspoke. So beta over two is always less than or equal to that variance. Oh, okay. So, so this is exactly where we recover the BKL bound without the strict inequality. So we recover most of it. Um, and the analysis here is slightly different. So they use, they phrase this correctly to use Jensen's. And then they get a less than or equal to. And then they find one special case where it's strictly less than two. And then say, OK, well, it has to be strict. We go about it a slightly different way, but in the end, we're using Cauchy-Schwartz to disentangle these, which is really kind of Jensen's if you squint at it. So we're using the same techniques, but we're doing a more, slightly more careful analysis that get, lets us add the beta in the end. Question? So, uh, what do you call some result of the second algorithm and you produce a, a If you make it, mm -hmm. So if you do that, then you're taking k independent samples from the same distribution, right? No, I take the same sample. I mm -hmm. partition it into k minus one part and the last three parts. Mm -hmm. Last part, and then I run the algorithm. OK. Then I produce everything again. Right, so let me look at the distribution that says, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to permute things randomly, and I'm going to look at the 1 over k random chunk from there. Yeah, you say you sample this. You sample data set. Ten, right? Right. So I think my claim is that in that case, I get a perfect variance reduction uh, if I phrase it correctly. And because. Right, but what I'm sampling from is slightly different. Right, if you partition them. So if you look at it, the algorithm is symmetric with respect to the order in which the elements appear. So the only thing that's going to matter is the overlap between your test set and your, you know, how big is the overlap? The from overlap one partition to the next. In the different runs. The analysis should should follow directly. Right. So so here, let me rephrase it maybe slightly. So here's what I do. I take my fold set that I have. I sample n elements from it, call that my, without replacement, call that my training set, and then the rest is the, call that my test set, and the rest is the training set. That's, I think that's equivalent to what you're proposing. Right, 
Right. You want to pay a correction every check for it every time. Every time and then go into it. So I think the analysis would hold. The only difference is in your case, you're picking the training, the two training sets to which they're just playing. Right. And you don't have a guarantee that they're test sets. The test sets. The well, test sets, both, right. yeah. Maybe. I mean, it feels like the best thing if they have no overlaps. Yeah, but you can have much more sets. You can have more sets, but that's got to break at some point, right? Uh, it could be, yeah. Maybe, yeah. That's an interesting point. All right, so I'll just leave this on as I conclude, since this is kind of the main statement. Um, I guess one thing that led us to this is to say, okay, this, is, this cross-validation thing is, is used left and right. So let's try to understand what exactly is going on with it and how much of analysis is there. Uh, there is a nagging, there's two kind of nagging open questions. One is the obvious one that says, well, you know, you proved some, you proved perfect reduction for one small case, but in the other cases you have this order one term and you have a reduction by square root of k instead of k. Is that really necessary? So can you exhibit kind of a lower bound that says this is how it should happen? Or is there weakness somewhere else in the proof? Are you loose somewhere else? And this is something that we don't quite know the answer to. So there, there are some hints that show that the proof is not tight. So we do definitely do lose something in the Cauchy-Schwartz, but maybe there's more to do. So here's the stupidest one, um, <laughs> which shows that the proof is, has some loose yeah. ends in it. Um, if I take, I, get, I have a training set, I take the mean. Yeah. Let's say it's some, it's, it's not a classification, so I look at the mean. We get a square, if you go through all of this, you get a square root of k variance reduction. You should be getting k. Kind of there's even much, much stupider or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pick a random point in your set. If it's a zero, you it's from zero. zero. It's the one that's a one. It's a majority. It's not a majority. You're well, it's expected majority in some squinty sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the thing like now, you know, you put in another point that's zero or one. Mm -hmm. You're really changing your distribution of hypotheses proportionally. Right. You know, well, you have to be a little careful. So we looked at majority for a little bit. Okay. Um, and to say, OK, how often, so I change one of my training examples. Yeah. How often will the majority switch? Um, one over root n. Right. That, didn't turn, that didn't lead us. I mean, maybe we didn't write down the right formula, but that didn't lead us uh, kind of in a fruitful direction. But that's kind of one of the. That's the immediate question is, okay, here's some analysis. Let's improve upon it. Let's see what the right measure of stability is. Or maybe if this is the right measure of stability, maybe we can tighten up some of the inequalities. But because at the end of the day, we're not doing anything deep when we're decomposing the covariance. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's so entangled that maybe it's hard to do anything much deeper uh, to do here. A different question is one that's posed by some of the practitioners, which say, OK, well, you know, right now you're averaging the estimates from all of the folds. But if I'm doing this, if I actually ran this in practice, and I see that 9 out of the 10 folds say that this has a very small error, and then one of the folds, something really bad example happened, and I have a huge error, 
maybe I should be doing something else. Maybe this tells me something else about the whole algorithm and the whole space. So you want a median or something like this? Uh, I don't know. I want median or I want to say, well, let me weigh the fold inversely proportional to the error that I, that I observed on it. So I don't do a straight up average, but I do a weighted average where I choose the weights wisely. Uh, can I get a better reduction? Can I get a better hypothesis in the end? And that's kind of the real question. So now we sort of understand what we're doing. If we want to improve upon what's going on, that's sort of the question that, that we want to answer. Um, Mm -hmm. And when the variance, if you did it once, is big, and sort of saying, if the variance is big, uh, then we don't care so much about reducing the variance as of saying, this is a horrible learning algorithm. Right. I mean, so kind of if the variance is big, let's mess with the expectation. Maybe we can have a biased uh, now, a biased predictor, which will have a much smaller variance. And the expectation will be small. It won't be unbiased, so the expectation is non-zero. But the expectation is small, and maybe the variance is small somehow also. I don't know. But that's, that's kind of the, next, the natural next step here. Any other questions? We're a little early. I, think I had too much coffee earlier. So. So this, uh, <coughs> I mean, any specific algorithm? Yeah. So the k-nearest neighbor has a bound of like 1 over, uh, let me just get to it. So the k-nearest neighbor has this sort of a bound on the weak hypothesis. So this 1 over m, 1 over m. So with probability, 1 minus 1 over m. This is the expected gap that you get uh, between them. So that's something from old work by DeVoy and Wagner from like the late 70s uh, is implicit in their work. So that's one. But because of the transformations, we only get this order 1 over root k here. And things don't work out perfectly. But, but there's not an SVM, for example. Mm -hmm. 